Men Wealth episode 8. Anton, uh, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate your time and thanks for taking the time out to come and share your story on, uh, on a men's wealth. I really trust and I believe that men will really um, learn from you. I think you're one of the, the older guys we've had on this uh, show, so I'm really looking forward to, to listen to your story and to learn from you. So Anton, as a, as a start, give us some background about yourself. Uh, currently, where you are? Are you married? Do you have kids? Yeah, so um, yes, I am married. We've been married for, it will be 30 years this year. Uh, we have, uh, my wife and I have two kids, a son and a daughter. My son's 27. Uh, my daughter's turning 23. Uh, she, uh, she turned 23 now. She was born in 2001. Um, so, uh, you know, a little bit further background, I'm the youngest of three kids, grew up in the south of Johannesburg. Um, my sister, my brother is much older than I am, it's, it's always been a point of debate in the family where, uh, where I came from. So, um, a hardworking father, incredibly hardworking father, a fantastic mother. Uh, very happy childhood. Uh, I've always had everything I could I could wish for. Went to school in Alberton. Uh, spent my two years in the artillery in Potsdam. Studied at the uh, University of Pretoria in economics. Um, then uh, joined an energy company in Malanga as a in their property department and uh, worked for that organization my entire professional life. Um, retired at the end of 2019, uh, after about 33 years of service, uh, and uh, luckily just before COVID, mm. and then uh, decided to join uh, what I think is supposed to be called the financial services industry did some postgraduate studies at the age of 56, 57 odd, mm. uh, which was a challenge. Um, and then joined the financial advisory practice and has been, uh, and have been there since. Um, and things have evolved much more than I anticipated initially. Uh, but it just shows how life goes. Mm. You know, it's been it's been an incredible journey all along, both professionally and where I work, let's say, more, a little bit more casually now. It's always been, work has always been um, a big part of my life and has always been a very fulfilling experience. Mm -hmm. And Anton, maybe just on your uh, career path, so you, you mentioned now that you worked 30, 33 years for, for one company. So I guess that also includes long hours and, and from, from what I know is being away from home a lot um, and needing to traveling a lot and needing to just work late nights and early mornings. So you also mentioned that you've, you've got two kids. Um, so how was that? Because I know a lot of men are currently in this midlife stage where they are not confronted with this, but they, they need to face long hours traveling, being away from, from home a lot. Uh, how did you experience that and how did you keep everything together? I mean, you're still married, you're happily married, you've got a great relationship with your kids. Just take us through that. How did you manage to do that? Yeah, I, perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps as a background is, is that uh, corporate life uh, is, if you decide on corporate life, it has its, it has its benefits and also its challenges. And I suppose it's the same if you, if you decide to to pursue an entrepreneurial life. Uh, added to that, the, the industry I worked in, the energy industry and the mining industry, uh, or, or at least in the days that I worked there, uh, it's, it, you know, it's, it's filled with uh, alpha males. You know, the competition is high. It is an industry that demands a lot because of commodity cycles, um, 
uh, it's an industry that demands a lot from its shareholders. So as you progress through an organization, you become acutely aware of that. Uh, you are also as, a, and as, a, as an aspiring manager, if I say that, or an aspiring uh, uh, young individual in an organization such as that, and you are identified and led well, you're also made to understand that sacrifice is, is, is a part of that life. And um, it took a lot, but it gave a lot. Mm -hmm. you know, one, one must always have that balanced view. You know, the amount of sacrifice that you, that you take and, and, and the hours that you give and you make those hours work and you, and you are able and fortunate enough to deliver the desired results. It is also uh, professionally, emotionally, and of course, financially rewarding. Mm. Um, but it can, become, uh, it can become a little bit addictive, if I may use, mm. I, yeah. I want to use those words sparingly because I know addiction has another connotation and can be a bigger problem than just being mm. addicted to work. But the demands are high. The competition is also high. There are only that much positions mm. or that many positions. And, and obviously there are many guys pursuing those positions and you have to make sure that you do the right things, you deliver the results to be considered for those positions. And once, and once appointed or uh, assigned, that you remain successful and that you deliver on expectation. Mm. So that's corporate life, and I don't, I don't know whether it's the same, still the same today. Mm. But I, 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 in the competitive world as it is today, I can think it's probably worse mm. than it was in the eighties, mm. nineties, and, and early two thousand. So you do spend a lot of time away from home, um, and you, and you do, and you, you don't get the opportunity to watch all of the cricket matches, to attend all of the debate competitions mm. and, and watch rugby practice and, and show the necessary support. I think to an extent, kids are also used to that. Um, you know, they don't know anything different. Mm. Uh, for me, as a, as an, as for me, when I was a child, I never saw my own father come home from work when the sun shines. Oh, wow. Never. Mm. It was just not, it just never happened. Mm. Uh, those days we didn't have television news, but these days we do, but he would come home after television news. Mm. So it was a frame of reference that I was used to, and I think to an extent uh, my family um, made peace with that. Uh, I have a terrific, and wonderful supportive wife that has, I think, luckily, uh, her father worked for the same organization that I worked for. Okay. So she had that point of reference of a traveling father and a away from home father. So I was, I was blessed with that. Mm. But the time that we could spend together, um, my wife, always made sure that the time that we were together, the we that weekends were, were packed with action, you know, that we do stuff together, that, mm. that we would take the kids for walks, we would take them uh, to experience things, we would, uh, my son and I started playing golf early together, mm. my, my daughter and I, she, she had a keen interest in other things, so I tried to do, she's a bit of an, an artist, but I, and I'm not, but, but I, I made sure that the time that I could spend together, the, we did things that she, that she liked. Mm. And, and my wife and I, we, we, we had our sacred time. Mm. You know, we played Rummy Cup uh, once a month on a Sunday evening. Mm. We, we went away on weekends uh, on, a, by, on our own. Uh, you know, once every quarter, and, mm. and we had wonderful parents, my own and my in-laws, that that could that could watch the kids for us. So, you know, if, if upon reflection, mm. I don't think that my kids are sitting somewhere now thinking, "I wish I could have more of my dad." Uh, I know that their dad's sitting somewhere and think, 
in, I wish I could have more of them. Mm. Um, uh, I know that when that when I when my son went to university, I was extremely tearful because I knew that that was the end of our you know very very mm. close relationship or, or quantity quantitative mm. relationship where we saw one another a lot. Mm. And I knew now it will be on appointment. Mm. Um, so it was, it was extremely hurtful for me when he left. And, and when I, uh, I had the privilege of working abroad for a, for a couple of years um, in the late 2010s, and I missed my daughter's entire high school career. Mm. But I found her twice a day. Uh, I had face time with her, despite the time difference, every morning before she went to school. I phoned my wife three times a day mm. when I was out of the country. So one, and luckily at the time, uh, FaceTime was introduced. Mm. Mm. It was before Zoom and Teams and WhatsApp call, but you had FaceTime on the iPad. So at least you could see one another, you could see facial expressions, uh, you could see stress, mm. um, uh, you could see heartbreak if there was, um, Although not ideal, I think both my wife and I had, we made during the times that I was away from home, we made a deliberate effort. Mm. And it is a two-way street. It's not as if it's only, it was only came from her side. I made sure that I found her when I woke up in the morning, despite the time difference. I found her when it was my lunchtime, that was before when she, she went to mm. bed. And I found her when, uh, when, uh, before I went to sleep, and that's when she woke up. Mm. But that was, mm. it was an institution. It was not only when there was a problem. Mm. And uh, for, for how many years was that? Four? Three? Four years? Um, yeah, just over three years, yeah. Sure. Yeah, just over okay. three years, yeah. Wow, and you still made it work, eh? Yeah, I think that, uh, it, uh, well, it is challenging. Yeah. But if you're blessed with a... If you're blessed with a, a good marriage that, mm. that's, that's grounded mm. and your value system is strong mm. and you, you know, from my point of view, I married the love of my life, you know, how could I not yeah. make it work? Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's uh, yeah. and, and from her side as well, you know, we best friends. So, you know, there was never a moment that I doubted whether, mm. you know, whether this, mm. this adventure, professional adventure of mine is going to, Mm. is going to challenge my marriage, never mm. crossed my mind. Mm. And, uh, and, and Anton, one thing that I want to touch on is from discussions that we've had, just, uh, things were not always just, in Afrikaans, we say, Mons, Kane and Rosa, you know, there were also some difficult times. So yes, of course. You, um, you did mention to me before that, that, that uh, your, your wife got diagnosed with cancer, um, and and there were other difficulties you faced, which 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 led to you also becoming a bit depressed and needed to go for for help. So mm. take take us through that as a man, and and you're building this career, you're in this highlight of your career, and you receive this news of your wife being ill. Um, I mean, you need to be a dad for your kids. You need to run a business. You need to manage people. Take us through that. Yeah, I think if I, I prior to that, I think it, it, it's only prudent to say that um, throughout my young life, uh, I was, uh, you know, this, um, this life of the party type of individual, you know, always had lots to say, always had many stories to tell. But in the early 90s, um, there was almost this, I don't know, it is as if there was a, a cloud started forming in me. And it is even before we got married. Uh, How old were you then, when it started? Um, about 28, uh, 27, 28, where, where I, it was, it was the first time, time in my life that I, at the time, wanted to isolate myself. Mm. You know, that I didn't like crowds. I, I, I didn't want to go where there were lots of people. I, I, I chose to, to be by myself more than being part of groups. It was, it's just, it, it's, you know, was it one Wednesday morning? No, but it just slowly crept that. And, and I started, I started 
sleep deprivation became something, you know, where I laid awake at night for hours. And uh, like my father said, you know, thinking about disasters that never would happen. Mm. So, so I became aware that I had, uh, that I had, there was something in me that, that was uh, vulnerable. Mm. Uh, despite, you know, doing the work that I did and, and uh, being the person that I was, um, uh, I knew that, there's, that I was, there was somewhere in me, there was a little bit of fragility. Mm. But I, we got married, um, Helen and I got married in 1994, and in 1997 Anton was born, and in 2001 Daniel was born, and in that time I, I did, uh, 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 my employer sent me to business school, uh, my career was, was you know, was, I, was, I, I couldn't have asked for more. The exposure was great, the, the, the challenges were fantastic. Um, uh, Helen and I built, oh, well not built, but we had a lovely home where we stayed in Mpumalanga. Uh, we had lots of friends and, and, and that, that, if I may use the word darkness, that fragility kind of dissipated, you know. It, mm. it's, I was probably too busy to, to feel sorry it. for mm. myself or something, mm. I don't know. But, and then, um, uh, you know, yeah, so career-wise, personal life-wise, it was just fantastic. Um, there was just, it was the, the prime of our lives. Our kids were small and, and I was working hard and Helene was doing her thing and, and we were just happy. Mm. And, and then an opportunity came uh, in 2007. Uh, where they, uh, the, my employer approached me and, and, and asked me whether I would consider a, a, a more senior job in, in Johannesburg, which, which would necessitate relocation and the kids out of school and selling houses and buying new houses and, you know, and that was obviously, it's a big excitement, you know, it's, it's, and if you're part of an industrial town and you're part of that organization, you know, and you get to advance, mm. You get to advance to the great city, <laughs> then, mm. you know, there's lots of accolades yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and people are glad for you. And, um, and I started on the 1st of July 2007 and I, the agreement with my employer, with my bosses at the time was is that we would relocate in January 2008 and I would commute the last six months of 2007. And I would stay with my parents or in hotels or guest houses and go home once a week, that type, you know, that type of arrangement. But nothing fixed. I, the situation was, was fairly plausible and, uh, or, you know, they, they, they were fairly um, flexible. And uh, about early September, uh, Helen was advised to buy as part of a routine checkup, she was advised to go for certain reviews or certain tests, you know, like ladies need to do. And, uh, you know, I came home from Johannesburg one afternoon and she said, well, uh, she went for this review and, and the doctor had to do an additional test and she would have the result after the weekend. So obviously, you know, Naively so, you, okay, yeah, all right, you know, additional tests and, and, um, and the Monday came and, and nothing happened and on, I don't know, administratively also something went wrong in the doctor's offices, but, or the, yeah, the doctor's uh, rooms. And I think about the, when, the, the Wednesday, uh, she got a call from the radiologists to say that uh, she has to go see a surgeon urgently. And she says, <laughs> but why? So administratively, there was a little bit of a confusing incident, but she phoned me on, a, on that Wednesday afternoon, three o'clock, and said she had a malignant tumor. And, uh, and I mean, you know, and, and if you hear that word, mm. I mean, Sure. You know that so 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 the family and I've always viewed it this way the family of the one that's being diagnosed 
has one experience. But you cannot compare it to the experience of the person with the diagnosis. Mm. And you have to differentiate carefully between the two, mm. I think, personally. Um, one thing led to the other. Um, that was the Wednesday. Saw the surgeon on Thursday. And Friday she was operated on. Mm. And, uh, you know, there we were. You know, on the day that South Africa beat England in the World Cup uh, in 2007. Mm. So, I could remember because I watched the game that, that night and fell asleep. So, for me, I was fairly tired for me to fall asleep in a Rugby World Cup match. So, that and you know, what led after that was obviously the chemotherapy, uh, the treatment, the tests. Um, that, and it really, sh it, it does shake the world of a family. Mm. You know, it, doesn't, it, 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 it was never about me, but it was about a young family, lots of prosperity, lots of love, lots of blessings, and all of a sudden there's this fear that mm. the person, the three of us probably love the most, you know, our wife and mother, you know, she has this, there's this challenge. Mm. So, you know, that shook me to an extent where I went back to my employer and said, take the, you can take, yeah. the, not in a bad way. Yeah. I'll take, take back my old job because I know you've not filled my job yet. But I want to stay where we are. I want to look after my wife. I'm not going to. So at the time, and that, that shows the value of people that, that, re that you can really trust and yeah. trusts you and shows the value of, of, of employers that has deep compassion for people, says there's no way you're going to do that. You're going to look after your family, you're going to relocate to Johannesburg, you're going to do your work and everything will be fine. Mm. And that's how it happened. Sure. You know, we, we built a house in Fairland in that time. We moved, we changed the kids, went to different schools. Mm. We went through, my wife went through chemotherapy and uh, you know, by in a, a year after that, it was just as we thought this was a distant memory, there was another f scare and uh, that was dealt with. And uh, same thing, kids, schools, you know, challenges. Luckily, we had, I had my in-laws in town in Fairland that were hugely supportive of us as a family. And then just as that was dealt with and, and, and she was healthy again and, and life went on as it was supposed to be a little bit, you know, normality yeah. came back. Uh, one day on her way back from Clearwater shopping center, she was hit by a stray bullet from the rifle of a policeman huh. in her back. So, okay, and you know, that also passed. And then in 2010, I went to India. But at that time, this cloud came back. Mm. And um, when I came back from India, it was, I cannot honestly not say that there was an incident, that there was a trigger, but I came back tearful, uh, exhausted, um, depressed and for the first time in my life things were just too much mm. it, you know it was and I could not put my finger to it I couldn't mm. say I'm working too hard or the work's mm. too difficult or, or life's too difficult mm. or it was a financial pressures or I, it, it, I couldn't point to it mm. but in 2010 um, I was I hit the wall, mm. you know, and I was in a deep, deep, deep black hole for, I can't remember for how long. Mm. And um, yeah, so that's how I got to that. And, mm. and, and I think it was probably a series of events mm. rather than an incident. But I, I knew that I was inclined to it. Mm. You know, I knew it that was, I was, there was fragile yeah. part. But then, so then you realized you, struggling with something and then you you sought help or yes what happened yes because i know also it's a pride thing for a man you're obviously yeah. in this big corporate company mm. to go to all of no, these guys that, now and i think that that's 
um, I, I think, you know, if there's anything to learn from this, there's, there's I, I didn't mind that at all. Okay. I admitted it to my wife that I'm not well. And she had, she could explain it to the kids because the kids, um, the kids are used to me being rather joyful and full of jokes and never serious. And yet I could see the total opposite. Okay. Uh, somebody that doesn't want to come out of his bedroom, that doesn't get up in the morning and, you know, goes to work at 10. And, and when he gets back to work, he just goes to bed. From work, he just goes to bed. So that they obviously thought that that was awkward. Mm -hmm. She could explain that to them. And uh, the first thing I did is I went to see our GP and she gave me something to calm me down a little bit because I was obviously extremely anxious. Because you, your, your, your first thought is that because of this condition, you're gonna lose everything. Mm. You know, you're gonna lose your wife, you're gonna lose your kids, you're gonna lose your job, you're gonna lose your house, your cars, everything that you've gathered. For and gathered yeah. yeah, and everything you love. So, so it calmed me down a little bit. And then I went to see, and I'm, uh, the, the only one name I would, except my family, one name that I would mention here is I went to see, I was recommended to go and see Juan Ferreira at the uh, Mosaic Church. Now, if ever you would ask me, you know, like they would sometimes ask celebrities, who do you want to play 18 holes of golf with or have a bottle of wine with? If you ask me, you know, who you would want to have a bottle of wine with, it will be Juan Ferreira, you know. Okay. So he's a, uh, he's a, such a terrific gentleman. And I've been with him since 2010, I don't know, mm. up 10 times. Sure. I've been with him many times, uh, not 20 times, but mm. perhaps 10. Wow. So, um, and, and he, I mean, it was, it was quick. He asked me a few questions and he says, you the, you know, it's a classic case of depression, self-doubt, bizarre thoughts, um, feelings of huge guilt for mm. things that never happened or you never did, but you feel guilty about them. And then there's a, a huge list of others. Um, all of the people that I deeply trust, and some personally, some professionally, I confided in. I went and I saw them and I said, listen, if you detected something, this is what it is. Mm. Sure. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't mm. taste it, but this is what it you is. You know what it is. Eh? Sure. But I'm gonna fix it. Mm. And uh, I took, went, went back to the doctor after a few sessions with Johan and uh, started taking antidepressants. Okay. And I take them until today. Okay. And. Uh, I'm not shy about it. Mm. Uh, I'm not scared. I'm not shy about the fact that I see Johan. I've, I've not seen him in a while, but I'm not scared to say that I think it's time. Mm. Uh, I'm not scared of the fact that I take that medicine. Uh, I once saw, if I may just, I once, in that time, there was a program on television sponsored by MediHelp. Uh, produced by Katinka Heinz, the film producer. Mm. And there was a program, I think it was one of the episodes about depression. Mm. And it was about her son. And although the, the, the symptoms and all of it was different, they, they spoke to, to, uh, to a, one of the, the doctors that they spoke to, I'll mention a second name, Dr. Franco Coulain. And they spoke to him about antidepressants and he said, and verbatim, and I will never forget those words, that antidepressants are not mind-altering. Mm. They just keep away the symptoms. Mm. Because the moment you think you take a tablet that's not going to work from your shoulders down, mm. but it's going to work upstairs, mm. you think that this thing is going to, you know, the Afrikaans saying is going to come your cop smoke. But it doesn't. It keeps, it restores the chemical balance, sure. and it mm. keeps the symptoms away. Mm. And I still take them today and I'm fairly proud of it that I've persisted mm. and that I've not once even thought of saying, no, I'm not going to do it anymore. Mm. Although I've not had a cloudy, if I may either use, use the words, mm. a severe cloudy period yeah. in, in recent times. 
um, I think to, you know, the, 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 I was hugely blessed by the fact that I had this loving and supporting wife and that I had, that the Lord blessed me with the insight to say mm. that if you want to do something about this, you have to involve others. Mm, sure. Anton, maybe as a, or not maybe, as a, as a last question, um, you mentioned now the, the blessing of the Lord of, of just revealing some things to you. So during this time of, of building your career and your, your wife's illness um, and the kids and the depression, what part did the Lord play in that? Where, did you ever doubt Him? Or, yeah, when these things happened, where, where do you think he was? Yeah, no, I, or is still? you know, there was, there was never a time in my life that I asked, why us? I, I cannot recall a moment that I went on my knees and said, Lord, I mean, why us? Mm. You know, that's, we, we, you know, everything's fantastic for us, so why would, why would, things for us become a little bit more difficult. Mm. There was never that time. So I've never doubted the role um, and the, the, the blessings that, that, and the grace of God throughout this time, mm. you know, throughout my life. Mm. Um, and the, the role, if, if I can role play what, what it meant to me is when Prior to Elaine's diagnosis, I had a, a huge reputation of, uh, of being extremely difficult to work with, with very little compassion and results was the only thing. Mm. And uh, feared, but certainly not popular. Mm. And, and during, uh, during Elaine's in her, during her operations and or, or on the morning of her operations, a gentleman that worked for me at the time on a contract basis uh, by the name of Stefan Lowe just rocked up at, at, at the hospital. And I thought, well, you know, because he heard at Sukuna that, you know, Anton's wife was diagnosed. And, and the next moment there were four more people from Sukunda. And I, I learned during the course of the morning that that was a, a prayer group. Mm. And except this gentleman that worked with us, the others were complete strangers to me. I've heard their names in town, but I've never met them. Mm. And they came and they, and they prayed for us, but, but, but prayed for Elaine prior to surgery. Mm. And the night before that, I phoned my brother, and that is 11 years older than I am, and said, come to Pretoria. And he was not, I didn't know that he was not healthy at the time, but he had a stroke right in front of my wife's operating theater hmm. while standing next to me. Hmm. And if it wasn't that it happened there, that I could shout up and down the passages to bring, you know, I was in hospital, so how easy was it to get a doctor there? It was yeah. fairly easy. Yeah. Until today, I wouldn't know what would have happened if my brother had that stroke somewhere in Cape Town or Stellenbosch or wherever yeah. he found himself. Wow. And the next day, my, my wife was in a normal ward and my brother in high care in the same hospital. Wow. And that was a sign. Yeah. It was a, it was something, a message, and uh, from that day, uh, I embarked on a role that I just think that I, because of that, because of those signs that I got that day, and I knew the Lord was present, they prayed for Elaine, they prayed for us as a family, and I said to myself, never again get people that I am involved with, that I can cause unhappiness in their lives. Mm. 
I have to be more endearing. I've failed since. Mm. You know, don't, don't doubt that I've not crossed that line mm. many times where lost patience, mm. under pressure. But the Lord gave me, on that day, gave me a message of endearment that here are all these people that deeply care for you. My colleagues, your friends, your and, and, and I behave the way I behaved, regardless of where people find themselves in their lives, with their own personal challenges, with, with their, maybe there were ill health in their families as well, but I was just forging ahead, mm, sure. phoning people at odd times of the night. Mm. And 2007, to an extent, to the, the, the time surrounding Elaine's uh, uh, operation or diagnosis, was a turning point for me that, you know, what, 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 what the Lord asks of you is not what you are doing. Mm -hmm. What the Lord asks of me is uh, endearment, mm -hmm. compassion, mm -hmm. uh, trust. And since I've, I've tried to, to live my life with that type of endearment, mm -hmm. being lovable, you know, despite the challenges, mm -hmm. caring for the person first, mm -hmm. because on that specific day, Mm. Everybody, that was anybody, my employer, our friends, they let rands and cents, results, share prices and mm. so on aside. Mm. They cared about us. Sure. Well, sure. Anton, thanks, um, thanks for sharing that. And I, I truly believe the men out there listening to this are really going to going to resonate with this. I truly believe there's a lot that, that we as young men can learn from you and it just shows you what the, the Lord can do in anyone's life. So thank you, Anton. I want to thank you for your time. You're welcome. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure chatting to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Right.